I'm going to talk about a concept which is at the heart of this book. Uh, it's actually both at the kind of geographical heart of the book, in the sense that it's a discussion that takes place in chapter three of a five-chapter book. It's also at the conceptual heart of the book. And the idea is the Washington Consensus. Um, the Washington Consensus has become this kind of shorthand for neoliberalism, a shorthand for the idea that the market should be given an unrestricted capacity to allocate resources throughout the economy. Um, the Washington Consensus was born within an emerging markets context. And although there is a kind of neoliberal element to it, what I want to try and describe is the way in which the Washington Consensus actually has kind of two separate lives that got pushed together. The first life of the Washington Consensus, the original life of the Washington Consensus, was um, a set of ideas developed by <clears throat> a British economist called John Williamson, who had a long career in Washington. Um, and the, the phrase was coined by him in chapter two of a nerdy book that was published in 1989 called Latin American Adjustment, How Much Has Happened. And in that uh, analysis, he provides a list of 10 policies, nothing revolutionary, nothing neoliberal, nothing terribly controversial, a list of 10 policies whose overall aim was just to give developing country policymakers an idea about the kinds of things they might want to consider doing if they wanted to plug their economy into this newly globalizing international economy. Um, the ideas included keeping your budget deficits relatively low, letting markets decide interest rates, uh, protecting property rights, spending public money wisely, um, encouraging the inflow of foreign direct investment, a very important concept I'll come back to, um, liberalizing uh, your trade, you know, reducing tariffs and opening the economy up to trade, uh, deregulating, taking the state out of uh, activities that are you know, unnecessary for the state to be involved in. Nothing by modern standards that was too controversial. His idea of the Washington Consensus, in other words, this fairly simple set of ideas about how to plug yourself into the global economy, was both descriptive in the sense that all he was doing, in a sense, was just describing a bunch of policies that countries like Chile and Turkey and Mexico had already been starting to implement in the 1980s. But it was also, for sure, a kind of prescriptive set of ideas, and that he was you know, making a set of recommendations. That was the original Washington Consensus, what in the book I describe as the pure Washington Consensus. Alongside it has evolved what I describe as the, the kind of the impure Washington Consensus. And in an emerging markets context, or in a developing countries context, what that means really is uh, an, a particular approach to managing the capital account. And in this particular, you know, this, this aspect of the Washington Consensus really had nothing to do with John Williamson. It was, a, it was an obsession, almost a fetish, of the US Treasury and the IMF. And the idea was taking that kind of neoliberal idea that the market should be given an overriding capacity to allocate capital across the economy. In, a, in, in the context of international capital flows, this, this uh, kind of fundamentalist idea uh, is one that says you should let the market allocate capital internationally. In other words, developing countries should not restrict capital flows. They should open their capital account and let capital flow in and out uh, willy-nilly, because the market is the, is the most reliable uh, mechanism to allocate capital globally in an efficient way. That part of the Washington, what became, so the, these two uh, parts of the Washington Consensus in principle are completely separable. In practice, they got fused together. And that fusing together of these two components of the Washington Consensus absolutely infuriated John Williamson. He spent a good chunk of the rest of his career writing these kind of raging articles saying, no, you misunderstood me. What I was saying, which is true, what I was saying, he said, is that the only form of capital that developing countries should allow in is FDI. John Williamson's belief was that all other forms of capital flow should be 
in the kind of in a sort of arena where developing country policymakers would use their discretion to impose capital controls, to use taxes, to use regulatory measures to restrict easily reversible capital flows. And that is the key sort of um, axis of the debate. The thing about FDI is that when a company comes into a developing country and acquires an asset, a greenfield asset, or acquires another company, that capital inflow is somehow bolted down. It's not easily reversible. But almost any other kind of capital, capital inflow that a developing country receives, whether it's a cross-border loan from a bank or uh, uh, an inflow into its equity market from a portfolio investor or an inflow into its bond market from a portfolio investor, um, those flows are, are pretty easily reversible. So, in spite of John Williamson's attempt to kind of carve out an area of capital account management um, that, you know, that he thought was wise, in other words, just let in FDI flows, the rest of the stuff you can control, this kind of fundamentalist approach to the capital account um, won. And it won at a very early stage during this kind of episode of globalization. And I should actually just say in kind of brackets, it's very important to remember in my view that episodes of globalization are just that. They're just episodes of globalization. There's nothing in the law of nature that says that globalization is a fact about the international economy that must be sustained. And this episode of globalization really dates from the 1960s. If you were a developing country before the late 1960s, early 1970s, the only way you could finance a current account deficit or a trade deficit was to borrow from the World Bank or get aid inflows from a rich country government or borrow from a rich country government. International, the availability of financing, international financing from private capital markets, from banks, from bondholders, just didn't exist. So we're in this historical episode of globalization. And as I say, at the very beginning of this episode, this kind of capital account fundamentalism um, became entrenched very early on. Um, one of the things that sort of supercharged the availability of, of or the growth of private capital markets um, and the availability from developing countries' point of view of access to international, uh, international financing was the consequences of the 1973 oil crisis, which quadrupled the price of oil, and which, as a result of that, created huge current account surpluses, trade surpluses, on the balance sheets of oil exporting countries, and simultaneously created huge current account or trade deficits on the balance sheets of oil importing developing countries. So it was absolutely clear to everybody that somehow those surpluses needed to be used to finance those deficits, because there was no way that those surpluses could be spent. You know, in 1974, Saudi Arabia's current account surplus was 50% of GDP. You can't spend on imports 50% of GDP. So it's going to stay as a kind of financial asset. So the idea was, how do we, how do we get this, this stock of dollars to kind of finance these deficits? And at that time, this is 1974, at that time, there was this absolutely kind of fundamental debate about whether the market should be given that role or whether policymakers should take on that role. Dennis Healy, who was the, at the time the British finance minister, um, came up with a plan. It was a Labour government, a socialist government, came up with a plan um, that would put governments at the heart of this recycling process, this process of taking the surpluses and making them available to deficit economies. He wanted to make governments and the IMF at the center of the, uh, at the, center of the, uh, the story. He came, uh, he clashed very heavily with William Simon, who was the, the US uh, finance minister at the time. And it was the US view that won over. And I'm going to read you a quote from Dennis Healy's um, memoirs, just, you know, which uh, captures what was going on. The Americans were bitterly opposed to his proposal to create an IMF facility to, uh, to intermediate these flows. The Americans were bitterly opposed because it would have meant interfering with the freedom of financial markets and the freedom of American commercial banks to make enormous profits out of lending to the third world. Um, so this idea that the market should be given this unrestricted capacity to allocate capital internationally 
was you know, sewn into the fabric of the international financial system very early on, and it was sewn in by the US government. And in that way, what you could say is that the US government at the time kind of converted its economic power into intellectual influence. It, it converted its economic weight in the global economy into a set of ideas about the way developing countries should manage their capital accounts. And the way developing countries should manage their capital accounts, according to Washington, um, was that, you know, just let the market decide. So that's the kind of the birth of capital account fundamentalism. And it was kind of a disaster um, in the sense that for two decades during the 80s and 90s, developing countries were the victims of more or less intermittent financial crisis. The crises of the 1980s were of a different character to the crises of the 1990s, but I think actually that's a, a secondary issue. What's, what's important is the, is the kind of commonality of the theme across those two decades, which was that the volatility of capital flows, which were unrestricted by policymakers because of this capital account fundamentalist approach, the volatility of capital flows created um, uh, booms and busts in the cycle of international lending. Um, what's ironic, given that the US was the, the sort of power that created this intellectual climate in which capital accounts should stay open, what's ironic against that background was that the most important factor in determining the volatility of these capital movements was US monetary policy. When US interest rates are very low in the United States, particularly in real terms. In other words, or maybe a better way of saying this is that when monetary conditions are very loose in the US, that tends to push capital towards emerging economies because investors are looking for higher returns. And when monetary conditions in the US tighten, that tends to suck capital back to the US, and that's what creates financing, gap, financing crises. Now I say, I'm making this a very general statement, you know, I say US monetary conditions are what matters. Because actually, it's very difficult to be more specific than that. Sometimes, it, or, in, or in other words, it's difficult to answer the question, which measure of US monetary conditions matters? Sometimes, it's the, sh the, the short end of the US yield curves. You know, in other words, it's the Fed funds policy rate that, you know, whose changes push or pull um, capital flows to and from emerging economies. That was the, the, true in, in the early 1980s, for example. Sometimes it's the long end of the US yield curve. In 2013, for example, there was an episode called the taper tantrum, um, where US 10-year bond yields rose very sharply. And it was that rise in US 10-year bond yields, nothing happened at the front end of the curve, that caused a, a very painful financing crisis for, for Turkey, South Africa, India, Indonesia, and Brazil. Sometimes it's nothing to do with the yield curve at all. Sometimes it's the dollar exchange rate that is the relevant measure of US monetary conditions that shapes capital flows. That was true in the run-up to the Asian crisis. In 1996 and the first half of 1997, in other words, the 18 months before the Asian crisis, which hit in June 1997, nothing really happened to the US yield curve. What happened was that the dollar strengthened very sharply against the yen. And it was that dollar appreciation that caused a very destabilizing terms of trade shock for Asian economies and that sucked capital out of yen. We're seeing the same thing this year. The capital outflow that has hit emerging economies in 2018, which you've you know, read about in the context of what's happened to Turkey and Argentina in the last few months, that was precipitated not really by anything happening to the US yield curve, but by a dollar strengthening against the euro. So uh, I, I think it's a mystery to me why the market pays attention to any particular measure of US monetary conditions. And it's also a mystery of, to me when there's a kind of regime change. In other words, when the market decides to stop looking at that and start looking at that as a way of gauging its risk appetite towards emerging economies. In spite of this 20-year episode of intermittent financial crisis, there was hardly ever or really never, any proper evidence that the US or the IMF, the US Treasury or the IMF, were willing to reconsider their commitment to this capital account fundamentalism. In fact, 
in September 1997, at the height of the Asian crisis, um, you know, the Thai baht, the Malaysian ringgit, uh, the Indonesian rupiah, the Korean won were all in a state of collapse. Everybody is showing up in Hong Kong for the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. Stanley Fisher, who was at the time the deputy managing director of the IMF, is carrying with him to the annual meetings a proposal to change the articles of agreement of the IMF to require all IMF members to open their capital account. In other words, right in the face of all of this bloody evidence that there might be something wrong with the system, um, the IMF was preparing to entrench capital account fundamentalism into the IMF's constitution. And it was only a year later, after the August 1998 Russian crisis, that the IMF you know, tech, well, formally kind of dropped uh, that proposal. So in the absence of any evidence that you know, the people responsible for the global financial system were prepared to make available these tools to, or to encourage countries to use these tools, countries themselves, by the end of the 1990s, were scratching their heads, looking back over the last two decades, thinking, wow, we've had a lot of financial crisis. What are we going to do about it? And the answer, really, in the absence of any you know, sort of uh, change in thinking about the wisdom of unrestricted capital flows, the, the answer was um, what economists often describe as self-insurance, um, what I more acutely describe in the book as wrapping up warmly. You know, in other words, you can't change the weather, <laughs> but you can change what you're wearing. You know, the weather wasn't going to change. Nothing was going to change the international system. So you have to protect yourself against the, the bad weather that the international system uh, creates. The, the, um, the principal mechanism by which that was achieved was through the accumulation of foreign exchange reserves. When capital flows out of your economy, having dollar foreign exchange reserves helps you because it gives you a tool to finance the capital outflow without causing... Uh, uh, collapses in your asset prices or collapses in your exchange rate. Um, that process of reserves accumulation, um, I think there are two, two points I want to make about it. The first is it was unbelievably successful. Um, in other words, the 20-year the, the process that we've, that we've kind of lived through has really seen a more or less incessant effort on the part of developing countries to achieve this, you know, more and more of this self-insurance to a point where, you know, I won't go into any of the technical details, but, you know, almost however you measure the concept of reserves adequacy, um, reserves adequacy is probably higher now, broadly speaking, than it's been at any time. One of the things that's been so interesting about 2018 is that although we've had another episode of capital outflows from emerging economies precipitated by a change in US monetary conditions, there are only two countries that were really affected in a nasty way, Turkey and Argentina. There's, in other words, there's no sense of there being a kind of proper systemic collapse of financial stability in emerging, in emerging economies. These two countries are it. The, the country that is most often kind of set up as the sort of third most likely country to suffer what Argentina and Turkey have suffered is South Africa. But even there, there's two very important differences between South Africa on the one hand and Turkey and Argentina on the other. The first is that South Africa has a highly credible central bank. Um, one of the problems that, that you know, caused the crisis to kind of evolve in both Turkey and Argentina is that both central banks, for different reasons, completely lost control of inflation expectations. And that means that there's no ceiling on what can happen to the nominal exchange rate. And there's no confidence that you want to actually own the local currency. So, for example, in August, there was a, a, a moment where the Argentine central bank raised its interest rate from, 40, from 45% to 60%. And within 10 minutes of that, the peso started to weaken. In other words, even at 60%, nominal interest rates at 60%, inflation expectations were so unhinged that nobody believed that a 60% nominal rate would give them a, a high enough real interest rate, i.e. inflation-adjusted interest rate, to compensate them for the risk of, of owning Argentine pesos. South Africa doesn't have that problem. 
The other important difference, so this is a bit of a digression, but it's interesting. The other important difference is that South Africa doesn't have um, something that economists used to call original sin. Um, this is the idea that if you're a developing country, it, it's not that easy to borrow internationally in your own currency. If you have original sin, then when you accumulate liabilities on your national balance sheet to finance your current account deficit, you're accumulating dollar liabilities. That's true of Turkey and Argentina, where the stock of dollar-denominated liabilities on each of those national balance sheets is about 70% of GDP. In South Africa, which in financed itself easily in RAND, interesting, it's, it's kind of a legacy of apartheid, because under apartheid, South African governments didn't have to spend resources educating black people, so they built a first-class uh, financial system, and that's a, it's a kind of legacy of that. Um, uh, South African dollar-denominated liabilities are more like 25-30% of GDP. So what that means is that when the exchange rate does depreciate as capital is flowing out, in South Africa, it, well, in Turkey and Argentina, when the exchange rate depreciates and you've got a bunch of dollar-denominated liabilities, the cost of servicing those dollar-denominated liabilities goes up. And so a weakening currency can't be separated from increasing default risk. But if you're borrowing in your own currency, who cares if your currency weakens? That, that link between currency risk and, and, and credit risk is broken. Um, <clears throat> so the first point about this wrapping up warmly process is it's basically been quite successful. Emerging markets, if you think about emerging markets as an asset class, um, which is kind of my world, um, it's a financially resilient asset class. Its financing needs are relatively low and its balance sheet strength is relatively robust. The other thing that I try and spend some time in the book discussing is the contribution that China has made to this process of wrapping up warmly. Um, since the early 2000s, China's, if China's influence on the economic lives of developing countries has been absolutely game-changing. Um, the commodities boom that lasted from 2001 until 2011 um, that was entirely the result of China's emergence into the global economy. Uh, that was the longest, the, the longest and biggest uh, boom in commodities prices in peacetime for 200 years. Now, I don't have time probably to go into everything, but what's interesting is this commodities boom had an absolutely phenomenal effect. Obviously, a commodities boom that's driven by China has a fantastic effect on, on uh, the trade uh, account of a commodity exporting developing country. But it's also true, interestingly, that even commodity importing countries benefited from this. Turkey is a good example. Turkey is a huge energy uh, importer. And so you would think, you know, if you only had a fresh sheet of paper, that when commodity prices go up, Turkey's bond prices should go down and Turkey's currency should weaken because of the terms of trade shock that, Tur that Turkey is suffering. That's never really what happens. Because what's traditionally happened is that the rise, one of the consequences of the rise in commodity prices is that there's an increase in global liquidity. And so although Turkey kind of gets it in the neck on the current account of the balance of payments, the increase in global liquidity automatically creates the means to finance that deficit. And so Turkey is kind of net OK. Um, so I think, you know, and, and even, you know, in more recent years, you can see the influence of China on the economic lives of developing countries. Um, the most recent was, uh, you know, kind of uh, an economic stimulus that China introduced towards the end of 2015 and sustained over the next couple of years, actually until the beginning of this year, which, you know, was incredibly supportive of, of emerging markets, economic performance, capital flows and everything. I, I won't go into that, but I'm happy, happy to answer more questions about it. There's a very important, interesting irony in the fact that China played such an important role in reshaping the economic lives of developing countries over the last uh, 20 years. Um, in, in other words, in the, you know, think about it in two periods. You have a period of the 80s and 90s, which, as I say, is kind of full of financial crisis, and you have a 20-year period since then in which emerging economies have been kind of, you know, progressively acquiring more protection for themselves. And it's that period 
in which China has emerged as this kind of new influence over the economic lives of, of developing countries. And the irony is that China was a fan of John Williamson's version of the Washington Consensus, but not the capital account fundamentalist version of the Washington Consensus. China was almost a perfect student of John Williamson in the sense that it did in, you know, not quite every, all of the measures that I, I mentioned before, but a lot of them. Interest rate liberalization, it never bothered, bothered with, for example, until a couple of years ago. But particularly in terms of managing the capital account, what China did was pretty much only to allow inflows of FDI and not the other stuff. And so China has persistently limited its exposure to the sort of uh, um, ugly capital outflows that other countries ended up being susceptible to. Other countries have done the same. India um, has you know, done the same. And I should say that it's a very important thing to bear in mind that it's not a simple conclusion to say that, well, because China and India built these fantastically successful economies, you know, reducing poverty, generating high rates of growth with relatively closed capital accounts, you can't, you can't argue that therefore everybody else can do the same thing. Because one of the things that's kind of uniquely true of China and India is that they have high savings ratios. And when you have a high savings ratio, you're not structurally dependent on external financing. The current account deficit, which is your, uh, the trade deficit, is kind of arithmetically equivalent to the difference between what you invest and what you save. So if you have a low savings ratio, Argentina, for example, or Turkey, or South Africa, then it's, that kind of automatically leads to a structural current account deficit. Because if you grow, then by definition, investment spending is going to be, uh, is going to be increasing. And so the, you widening the gap between investment spending and savings, and that is the current account deficit. So you need capital inflows to get it. So if your savings ratio, if your savings ratio starts off low, it's difficult to avoid running current account deficits. And if you're structurally dependent on a current account deficit to grow your economy, then it can be difficult if you're a policymaker to start being picky about what kind of capital flows you want. That's another area of discussion that I, I don't have time to get into. But what I want to end on is just the suggestion that we may be reaching a point which is kind of equivalent to what I described the 1970s as. You know, I described the 1970s as a period of a sort of moment in history where the US converted its economic power into intellectual influence over the way developing countries' policymakers should consider their options. And it's possible to think that China may be in a similar type of process, that China might evolve as being a shaper of the policy choices facing, uh, facing developing countries. In the first place, China has already had an influence in the sense, in the sense that China, for sure, has contributed to the death of capital account fundamentalism. This idea, although, you know, as I said, it was, it was still very much alive in 1997 at the IMF World Bank meetings in Hong Kong, by 2012, the IMF published a paper uh, known uh, widely as the Institutional View. And this Institutional View um, basically kind of uh, acknowledges that maybe developing countries using capital controls every now and then to manage the volatility of international capital movement, not such a bad idea. The IMF may well have come to that conclusion by itself by looking at the kind of the devastation <laughs> that the previous 25 years had, had caused. But for sure, the, the role of China, the, the success that China exhibited as a country that you can actually keep your capital account relatively closed and still do well, that demonstration effect, I think, for sure influenced this evolving view of the IMF and, and helped contribute to the death of, of, of capital account fundamentalism. And what's also true is that whereas China in previous years kind of tended to push away the idea that you know, China should be a model for other developing countries. Uh, the 19th Party Congress last year, that, that no longer the case. China you know, sets itself up these days as a model for, for other developing countries. And so very quickly, I'll just conclude by making two quick points about what a China-shaped world might look like, or what I describe in the book as what a Beijing consensus might look like. 
And I think of it as kind of, you know, very broad terms as running along two spectrums. The first is a spectrum between discretion and rules. A rule-based approach to managing the international monetary system that we've had in the last 30, 40 years is, you know, the rule is you open your capital account. The rule is you, you let the market allocate capital globally. Dis a discretion, if we move along that spectrum towards discretion, what you're making room for is the idea that the policymaker um, ha you know, should have the capacity to decide that you know, this kind of capital inflow is good, this kind of capital inflow is a bit dodgy. And I think we are going to be moving, well, we are moving along that spectrum. The other spectrum um, that I think is relevant in this context is a spectrum between the market and the state. Um, and that's a spectrum that I'm going to leave you with an unsatisfying conclusion, I'm afraid. That's a spectrum I, I, that I, yeah, I'm just a bit more confused about. Um, because, I, I mean, this, this spectrum is connected to the rules discretion spectrum. Because if you're making room for more discretion, if you're you know, giving, giving space to policymakers to decide um, what kind of capital flows to let in or not, it's a kind of you're sort of opening the door to increasing policymakers' involvement in the economy as a whole. And of course, China has been extremely successful um, with a very active state. Um, and uh, and I, I expect we'll be moving uh, along that spectrum too, with, with consequences that I think are not necessarily going to be very benign. Um, and I'll just m make this point by you know, bringing you back to this earlier uh, point that I was trying to make about historical episodes of globalization. This historical episode of globalization, the one that began in, in the 1960s uh, or so, began because the previous 30 years, the 30 years after the, uh, the uh, 29 financial crisis, was a period in which state involvement grew and grew, um, particularly around an idea called import substituting industrialization. And that was, you know, in a way, just as I've described this period of capital account, you know, unrestricted capital account mobility as a failure, it's also true that the previous period in which developing countries didn't have access to international capital flows, where the state was highly active, in the, late in the early 1960s, Brazil had like 90 car companies. Uh, sorry, not Brazil, Latin America had 90 car companies. The average output of each company was like 6,700 units. This import substituting industrialization, in other words, the pre-globalization economic model, was unbelievably inefficient because it didn't permit for economies of scale. So I'm not necessarily trying to make a, a recommendation or make a kind of a normative point that if we go back to more state involvement, that's a good thing. I'm really just saying that the, you know, the way I see these episodes of globalization shift uh, makes me think that that's more likely to be the direction of travel. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to make some uh, brief comments and then open the floor to, to, to questions. So first of all, let me, uh, let me say that uh, The Dance of Trillions is really a very fascinating book. It reads a little bit like a, like a thriller. You go from uh, Havana in the 1920s <coughs> Uh, with some booms in uh, liquidity and uh, capital flows, and then you move on to the next stage of globalization with the Mexican crisis, uh, the East Asian crisis, the Russian crisis, the petrodollars. Um, so it's almost as thrilling as Brexit. Not quite, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, it's also an extraordinarily wide-ranging book, as you, uh, as you have just heard uh, from David's uh, fantastic presentation. And uh, I would just like to emphasize a few, a few points and also maybe open the, the discussion on a number of issues. So the first thing that, he, that came, comes out very, uh, very strongly is that indeed globalization, and in particular financial globalization, is not a natural phenomenon, a law of physics or, or a fact of life. Indeed, it depends on a number of historical determinants it depends on very much on policies, maybe on some idiosyncrasies. So we know that uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, 
Actually, Keynes was very happy to sit in London and be able to import a lot of goods from uh, the rest of the world and to invest in Argentina, in railways, in faraway countries. He was actually writing about that um, and, uh, and, and really very happy about the state of fact before the First World War and thought that uh, that was contributing to the, to the wealth uh, of the country. Uh, however, after the First World War, after the Great Depression, we've seen a complete reversal of this first wave of, uh, of globalization. And as David pointed out, if we think about financial globalization, so not trade, but financial globalization, really it's since the 1960s that we have seen again financial flows really growing a lot and growing, I would say, at a rate that we hadn't seen probably in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. So just to give you some ideas, if you, if you uh, go back to the beginning of the 1960s and you think, you know, let's take the United States, how much did the US have in terms of uh, cross-border asset holdings in the 1960s in terms of its GDP? So that all the assets that US citizens would hold on the rest of the world, whether they would be FDI, whether they would be equity or debt, it would be about a few percent of GDP, not more. Now, if you fast forward to now, roughly, you have 150% of GDP, this, this order of magnitude, 130%. So a tremendous increase. And the US is a, is a huge economy, so of course that's, that means a lot of billions of, of dollars. Think of smaller open economies in relative size, that's even more impressive. At the eve of a crisis, if we think about the amount of cross-border holdings of uh, Switzerland, that would be like seven times the G GDP, 800% of GDP. Same thing for Iceland. So we've really seen a huge increase in financial globalization between 1960 and 2008. And now again, um, after the crisis, we've seen a, a drop and then it's, it's increasing again. Now, this has a lot of consequences, what has uh, been going in terms of uh, of this increase in financial flows. And one of the uh, recurring theme that we have seen in emerging markets, and that has been very well described here also by, by David, is this idea of boom-bust cycle. So we see these uh, money flows moving into emerging markets, often linked to uh, some specific uh, events. So there could be the petrodollar recycling, there could be loose monetary policy, US monetary policy, as pointed out by David, pushing a lot of his credit supply of his, of his flows onto various emerging markets. And then, as we see maybe some political uncertainty or as we see a US uh, Fed tightening, dollar going up or uh, movement in the yield curve, we see abrupt capital flights. And this has been a recurring theme. If you think about all these emerging market crises that I pointed out, <laughs> a moment ago, like Mexico, like Asian crisis, etc. you have seen this very, very abrupt boom-bust cycle, which have been extremely disruptive. There are, of course, amplifying factors. So this balance sheet issue of, uh, of emerging markets, having dollar debt, a lot of dollar debt, for example, definitely was an amplifying factor uh, in East Asia uh, in, and, and also in Mexico. So, the vulnerability of countries depend on a number of factors, but this general theme of boom-bust cycle is really a powerful one. Now, what I would add, though, is that it's not only for emerging market. Mm. And if you, if you now look at the anatomy of the last uh, 2008 crisis, the, the great financial crisis that we have been living through, also with the euro area crisis, you actually see a very similar pattern. Look at Spain. Look at Ireland. You know, these were boom-bust cycle very, very also damaging. So a little bit, I would say, similar cause, similar effect. And this applies both to emerging market and advanced economies. So I, I've done quite a bit of work on those issues, um, finding out that effectively there's a global financial cycle with a lot of co-movements of credit, leverage, etc., And a lot of it having to do with uh, US monetary policy and, and, and other possible factors. So now one of the things I would ask David <laughs> is, um, so we are here, you see, it's, can business help solve the world's problems? <laughs> and not only business, but I, I guess also policymakers. So mention, you mentioned a lot of you know, the new uh, 
Washington consensus and uh, the pure, the impure form, and now that we are going back a little bit. So I think there has been a lot more awareness of these uh, boom-bust cycles, partly be because of this last uh, global crisis, which you know, uh, was a, a very general phenomenon. And uh, in particular, so there is some, some attempt in, uh, in the policymaking world to, uh, to tame these, uh, these uh, credit cycles, to tame this financial cycle via, so one avenue can be this capital flow management, which is some kind of capital controls. Another avenue is the setting up of new institutions called macroprudential authorities, which are institutions specifically in charge of dealing with systemic risk in economies of the type of uh, financial cycles. So now I'm going to ask you, so do you think that uh, these, uh, these new developments, in particular these new institutions that have been set up, will have will be effective, will have any effect in the emerging market world, in the advanced world, or do you think these are again kind of more like national tools and what we really need is really a rethink of the whole system. So rethinking a new Bretton Woods, which would really be coordinating these, these actions as opposed to having these you know, national actions to try to tame this, these cycles. So that would be the, the, the first question I would, I would want to ask you. And then I will have a second one, but maybe we can we can wait for that, and, and okay. of course other people would... Uh... Um, I'm not sure I know how to solve the world's problems, <laughs> unfortunately. But on, but on the issue of reforming the global, you know, the sort of international monetary system, I think the, 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 reality, the, the reality is that that's not going to happen this side of a war. Uh, you know, the, a, a proper renegotiation of the international monetary system that would involve some... Um, redistribution of international monetary power is not going to change. It's not going to happen until there's a redistribution of all sorts of other types of power, and I think there's only a war that's going to do that. I don't want to be too depressing, but, but I think for the time being, the, mon the international monetary system that we have is the one that we've got. Um, I think that capital control, you know, capital flow measures and macroprudential tools will help. And what I hope, I mean, again, the, the, the last section of, of the book is, is where I try and kind of conduct a, not a thought experiment, just play with ideas where, okay, so the accumulation of reserves has been necessary because of the unavailability of capital control uh, tools. If you move even gradually into a world where capital control tools and macroprudential measures become more acceptable, then the need for the reserves goes down, in theory. It's a little bit that, of a paradox what you say, because China has a lot of reserves and has also <laughs> yes. capital controls. But China, yes. yeah, that, that paradox is true. Um, but China has a number of other problems confronting its capital account. I mean, a, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can, we can get onto that. Um, the, the, and one of, the, one of the benefits of this, if it would happen, if, you know, if there was a sort of coordinated mechanism by which, or a coordinated, uh, yeah, coordinated mechanism by which the need for reserves adequacy falls because you can control, for, you, know, you can deal with capital account, uh, or capital flows volatility through controls, the benefit that that would have is A, that holding reserves is expensive. You know, typically, well, in, theoretically, what happens is that you, you own foreign exchange reserves, you're earning you know, 3% or whatever the US uh, Treasury yield is on them. But most emerging market central banks will sterilize those purchases. So you're, you're earning 3% on you know, your foreign assets, but you're paying a, a domestic interest rate uh, that's higher than that on, the, on the, the domestic debt that you issue to sterilize the monetary consequences of owning these reserves. And that's expensive. So if there was a a coordinated or yeah, even non-coordinated uh, outcome where, you, where the stock of reserves can fall, you save sterilization costs, and also you have the benefit, potentially, of financing infrastructure, um, which, you know, in other words, you need, you, you, you know, at the moment, you need liquid foreign exchange reserves to confront the possibility or deal with the possibility that there might be a sudden reversal of, of capital flows 
if you don't need liquid foreign exchange reserves because you're dealing with the problem of the capital controls, then you can turn those reserves into non-liquid investments. And the most obvious, um, uh, the most obvious kind of candidate for that illiquid investment would be infrastructure, given, given infrastructure shortages. If you can just follow up, because it's on, on mm. China. Yes. So uh, the book, at the end of the book, he has this very interesting uh, uh, thought about uh, China shaping, indeed, the way the, the new rules of the game, how they could play out for the emerging world and, and beyond. And so this is, this is very interesting because it's pretty, it's, it's pretty obvious that, indeed, in, the, in terms of uh, real economics development in the... In, in terms of trade, in terms of the commodity space, China has had a tremendous influence on the, the whole of the emerging world and, and, and beyond. But um, in a way, you are stretching that to say China is, is really going to play a major role in rethinking the rules, in, in influencing mm. uh, the way emerging markets look at their capital account, etc. But if we think about what the financial world looks like today, and in particular the international financial order, I mean, this is not obvious at all because there yes. is this huge gap between the Chinese impact on the real economy, on trade flows, et cetera, and the Chinese impact on financial system, yep. which is very minimal, minimal. I mean, it's very, very small by, by any financial measure. And if you think about what the role that the US dollar still plays, which is far beyond the role of the US economy, I mean, there is a very specific financial order all around the US dollar which is reflected very much in the fact that the US is issuing a huge amount of you know, reserve assets. Uh, so if you look at the, the external balance sheet of the US, you, you see a very specific balance sheet. We, we call the US a world banker for a reason, which is uh, you know, the type of investment the US has abroad as opposed to the type of liability that is issued, which is held everywhere. And so the US is effectively a provider of global liquidity, and we have seen that very much during the last global financial crisis. Yeah. Now, China is the reverse image of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So it's really not in a position of being a global liquidity provider, etc. So it's not at all obvious how this shift. Yeah. If you have a global liquidity provider, you have power, right? People want your, your liquidity in, in really bad times. That gives you a lot of power. China, right now, is, not, is in the reverse position. Yeah. So how are we going to make the transition? I mean, yeah. how is it going to play out? No, that's a, yeah, I, I, you got it. You got me. <laughs> uh, you know, another, and I was, I was very kind of nervous writing that last chapter because I realized that I was expressing a view about not the next thing to happen, but maybe the next after the next after the next thing to happen. And the interim is, is very, very unclear, and you describe it perfectly. Um, in, and the situation that China finds itself at the moment is where, you know, the, the, the internationalization of the renminbi is essentially a failure. Um, there was a period up until 2015 where you know, people were getting excited about, uh, about the internationalization of the renminbi and the idea that China could you know, acquire kind of financial power to you know, begin to match its economic power. Um, in 2015, for example, almost 30% of China's trade was settled in renminbi. And everybody was taking this as evidence that you know, the RMB was you know, becoming an internationally acceptable uh, currency. As it turned out, all that was happening was that the world was kind of punting on the, on the idea that the RMB was going to go up in value. So if you were a, a Chinese trading partner, sure, you'd accept RMB uh, in payment for the good that you were selling China because you thought it was kind of cool to own RMB because you thought <laughs> they would, they'd make, make you money. Mm -hmm. After 2015, when that became less clear, the amount of China's trade that settled in renminbi collapsed. Um, and so has the stock of renminbi deposits in Hong Kong collapsed. Um, so uh, China remains a kind of um, a minnow in international finance. And I think that that will remain true for a long time. Because in truth, I think the problem that China is suffering now is that, you know, for the last three decades, Chinese people, you know, Chinese firms, Chinese house households, have accumulated a lot of wealth that's largely in renminbi, partly because they were quite happy to accumulate wealth in renminbi because most of the last 30 years, the renminbi looked incredibly undervalued. So you thought it was you know, good to be long renminbi, um, but also because of capital controls. You couldn't actually diversify your portfolio very easily. Now, the return on capital in China is very low. The renminbi is not obviously undervalued, if anything, the opposite. And so there's this kind of pent-up demand for international diversification of China's wealth portfolio. 
And that is why China uh, pays very close attention to the amount of reserves that, it's, that it owns, uh, very reluctant to see those reserves fall below $3 trillion. And it's also why, at the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, the PBOC, the, the, P, uh, the Chinese Central Bank, set up a, a whole new network of controls on capital outflows mm -hmm. because they're worried that the potential demand for acquisition of foreign assets on the part of uh, Chinese firms and households um, could be potentially devastating to the Chinese capital mm -hmm. account. Maybe I'm kind of oversimplifying your issue, but in a way, your decision problem is analogous to the decision problem of somebody who decides to buy a 20-year Nigerian bond. You know, I know that Nigeria's got a ton of foreign exchange reserves now and can probably pay the first coupons, but I don't know if it's going to be able to redeem the bond in 20 years' time or to pay debt service, you know, from years 10 to 20. And so the bondholder... You can sell the bond, right, because it's a financial asset. Here, we, when you talk about foreign direct investment, that's the only type yes. of investment that should be allowed. And that means that I'm locked for 20 years. Yes. I cannot get liquidity. Yes. Whereas for the bond, that's, yes. that's fine. Well, I, I guess, I mean, I don't know. In theory, it seems to me like your problem is answered by, two, by adding two components into your, into your you know, cost of uh, capital. One is the, the country risk premium, and that's evident. In the, in the pricing of Nigerian euro bonds. And the other is a liquidity premium. I don't know how you price, the, you know, because you don't have the liquidity premium in the Nigerian exactly. bonds. I don't know how you price the liquidity premium. That's, that's a question. But that's not, in a, in a way, that liquidity, the pricing of that liquidity premium is not necessarily a Nigeria specific. Well, I guess it is a bit Nigeria specific. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twenty percent of your interest payment using this exchange rate, and the balance would be in another exchange rate. Yes, yes. And all of a sudden, you have a totally different situation because mm. the whole economics just changes, right? And it's not the liquidity yeah. premium per se, right? It's yeah. the question how these guys in five years would think they should behave in order to control the capital account at mm. that time. Mm. I guess in that case, you should be using the eurobond market to hedge the, the, li the liquidity problem that you have. Uh, but it's not. In other words, you buy, you're buying insurance. You buy, you, well, you, you would buy yeah. credit insurance yeah, yeah. on Nigeria. And the, uh, that costs 20% per year. That's a problem. <laughs> it's a risky country. Yes. <laughs> That's why we're there. <laughs> Uh, I think you raised a very good point in your last paragraph, uh, no, last uh, section of the book, right? And I'm just trying to understand the lip of that. Uh, do you think uh, what China is trying to do with the one belt, one road policy is in a way trying to further its extension of, I would say, financial control over the rest of the world? But unfortunately, it hasn't gone quite the same way yeah. as they have thought so because they were trying to do maybe 30 years of what U.S. has done mm. in less than five years. Mm. So basically, instead of slowly working its way through soft power, it was going through, if I can't get them, I'm going to get them indebted in Chinese renminbi dollar. Yeah, that, no, I think that's wrong. Um, there are lots of different ways of describing the Belt and Road Initiative, but, yeah. but I think that, that's wrong. Partly because one of the features of the Belt and Road Initiative, funnily enough, is that the renminbi is not a financing currency for the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's become a huge problem for China. When, when you know, the, uh, she announced the Belt and Road Initiative in late September 2013, and then during the whole of 2014, Chinese policymakers were running around setting up all these new financing mechanisms to finance projects in the Belt and Road, the Silk Road Fund, and a recapitalization of the China Development Bank, and recapitalization of the China Exim Bank, and uh, a capitalization of CIC, the um, investment vehicle of, of all of these, all of these funding vehicles were set up with China's foreign exchange reserves. In other words, they were dollar funded. And although some projects in the Belt and Road are funded in renminbi, the general rule is that these projects are funded in dollars. So was that the mistake that they made? Well, I'm not sure they had a, I'm not sure they had a choice. In fact, I had a, uh, it's a bit of name dropping, but it's a good story. Um, last year, there was a big Belt and Road Summit in May um, in Beijing, 
um, and she announced a 100 billion renminbi uh, addition in capital for the Silk Road Fund, which had originally been capitalized in 2014 with $40 billion. Um, I had a meeting in Beijing earlier this year with, uh, with the chief executive of the Silk Road Fund, and I asked him, you know, what are you going to do with this 100 billion uh, renminbi of capital? And he kind of shrugs his shoulders and said, I've got no idea. <laughs> and, you know, there, there's a, in, in fact, what I would describe as a kind of dollar constraint at the moment on, on China's ability to pursue its objectives in the Belt and Road Initiative um, because it, it doesn't have many dollars. Um, and actually, that's leading to a very interesting change in the nature of the Belt and Road Initiative because China is now having to talk more and more about co-financing its, uh, its, you know, its, its loans with people like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or the AIIB or the EBRD. Now, the problem is once you bring a multilateral development bank into the mix, the multilateral development bank is legally obliged to have an open tender process to choose the contractor. So the old style Belt and Road Initiative <laughs> where CDB, you know, the China Development Bank, shows up with a big loan and here's my, you know, by the way, here's your contractor, you know, Chinese <laughs> state-owned enterprise is going to you know, build, the, uh, build, the, build the port. That can't happen. And so the, in a way, the, the economic or the consequences of this dollar constraint that China is facing could be to kind of multilateralize um, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is not a bad thing um, because you know, China's got into a lot of stick for the way in which some of the projects um, lack transparency, have relied excessively on Chinese contractors, um, and have extracted very high rates of return from, um, uh, from the recipient countries. And, you know, the point that you make about debt, di debt diplomacy is, is a valid one uh, in, you know, in certain countries, in, I mean, in Sri Lanka, in Djibouti, in, in, in a couple of others. There have been, you know, there are serious questions about fin about financial stability that result from China's involvement. Actually, let me let me pose a question. Actually, it relates a bit to Ellen's point. I teach this course, emerging markets, and you know, it's every time, sometime early January, when I have to draft the syllabus, it's a bit unclear what emerging markets are. Ah. Then I try calling, you know, some friends. Uh, mostly they are traders, and you know, they will tell me, "You come from one? Greece is an emerging market." Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's all I thought. <laughs> So, but then Ellen pointed out that, you know, the U.S. monetary policy shocks or, you know, global risk aversion, you know, Ellen mm -hmm. proxies with the VIX tends to correlate a lot with emerging market type of phenomena in Spain, in Ireland, in many other countries, mm -hmm. which, you know, traditionally you wouldn't associate with emerging markets. Yeah. So I wanted like, to get actually the views of... Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's analytically completely useless um, term. Uh, I mean, you know, it, I mean, you know, the history, it's a marketing term. You know, you have in the, in the sort of 1980s, you have a globalizing financial system. Uh, capital is flowing to developing countries. What used to be, I mean, I use the term developing countries in my book just because I'm, I'm talking about these, these places over a, over a time period well before the term emerging markets um, was invented, which was, you know, in the late 1980s. So I think developing countries just a, a kind of prior uh, way of, of describing these countries. Um, so, you, you know, the term emerging market is kind of invented to create an asset class, to kind of make, uh, in, you know, the world's investable money look at these, you know, look at these countries for the first time in a while. Uh, to give you a sense of how absurd it is, uh, you know, my business card says I'm the head of emerging markets economics at Citi. Um, the economist that covers Singapore works for me. The economist that covers Korea works for me. Um, both of these countries probably have higher per capita GDP than the UK at this stage. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's completely indefensible. It's just, you know, the, the, it's an industry norm. And the, the creation of an industry norm creates inertia. So, you know... Even you know well beyond the 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 phrase. I mean, if if it, if it ever if it ever had any analytical value, which is doubtful in itself, the the, the inertia of the way the asset class is set up is that the um, the term will outlive its analytical robustness, which has definitely happened. <laughs> yeah, you should probably review your classification at this point. Yeah. I think <laughs> we also have at the school. Please, there's another question. And you call uh, emerging markets an asset class, but if you look at the um, 
actually asset class like debt, equity, currencies, and emerging markets, it's something like uh, various asset classes across one, not probably geography, but a kind of... It's a, it's a functional classification yeah, rather exactly. than a geographic it, it, classification. It, exactly, because yeah. uh, uh, I had a discussion with guys who said, we want to invest in Africa. I said, well, listen, uh, but to invest in Africa, you can have an exposure to 100 whatever type or subtype of uh, various things, right? You can sell to Africa whatever goods, right? You can buy African currencies, you can uh, do direct investment into, I don't know, something, right? And people, uh, they cannot map correctly what they meant by either emerging markets or an asset class. And it, it turns out that sometimes you are talking without understanding that yeah. you are talking about the same or different things, yeah. right? Yeah. Because when you, st when you try to establish the risk, how is it, okay, the risk in emerging markets, and then all of a sudden, guys are coming with derivatives, with fixed income, with mm. currencies and everything. Mm -hmm. So let me also conclude then, uh, since there are no more questions, with what is the, you know, the view, I guess, looking forward? So we have had, uh, you know, a change of government in, Brazil that was perceived as good news uh, by the markets. And, you know, myself doing a bit of research in political economy and caring about things such as courts, democracy, you know. Yeah. I'm getting these <laughs> views that there is a disconnect between what the markets believe as good news and what, you know, you know I tend to view. And I, not as, uh, as, as, as Elias, but as a scholar working yeah on institutions and development, clearly pointing out that, you know, the better courts, the more efficient uh, the legal system, let's say, is, or, you know, the more efficient the parliament is, or the higher the trust in basic core capitalist institutions, the higher productivity and long-run development. So how you could, and, you know, Helen is also an intellectual giant here, so, you know, how you can reconcile those two, uh, you know, distinct features. You know, Bolsonaro at yeah. the same time, Good news for the markets, but you know, nostalgic of the dictatorship, which actually many people lost money and lives. One of the um, mm. one of the earliest lessons I learned working as an economist in financial markets was money has no smell. <laughs> uh, in other words, you know, capital flows don't make moral judgments, um, and you may not like Bolsonaro's politics, but from a you know, from uh, the point of view of a market participant trying to assess the risk of, you know, Brazil, you know, the prospects of Brazilian growth, you know, Bolsonaro is a guy who's saying that he wants to liberalize the economy, he wants to uh, liberalize trade, he wants to implement a pension reform to make public, uh, public finances more sustainable. Um, you know, so, you know, there's, a, there's this kind of, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that as a, as a human being, you may not like about what, what, he, you know, what he says and what he wants to do with the country. But from an economic policy perspective, um, there, is a lot to, there is a lot to respond to. And the, the important thing to bear in mind is that this coming out of a period where you know, Brazilian policymaking, for different reasons over the last five or well, seven or eight years, Brazilian policymaking had been really, by almost any standards, really awful. Um, so the market is responding to a change in, you know, the economic policy framework. I completely take your point that it's possible that Bolsonaro may do damage to Brazilian institutions in a way that would undermine Brazil's growth potential, but that will be the second round. Yeah. Elaine, I don't know whether you have any views on that. And I just yeah. use Bolsonaro as yeah, one yeah. example. And I don't, but, but, uh, since this is about emerging markets and finance, I'm just worried, setting aside moral issues, you know, about long-term financial risk or perhaps tail risk. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I think you, I mean, I would, uh, I would second that in the sense that uh, there's quite a large body of empirical research that does show that long-run growth potential are deeply affected by institutions. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that uh, uh, you are undermining institutions, you are definitely jeopardizing your long-run growth. Now, what we also know is that markets are extremely myopic. So for me, with, for example, trying to predict crisis, what I know is that if you try to predict crisis using market prices of financial assets, you are going to fail miserably. 
because markets are absolutely not forward looking beyond the next day almost. So that, for example, if you try to predict the 2008 crisis with uh, market price data, you're not going to see anything until the crisis effectively is unfolding. And then you're going to see this amazing volatility. And yes, then the markets will rank that this bank was actually more risky than this other bank. Yeah. But actually, the market didn't tell you yeah. before that these, all these banks were actually risky. Yeah. Uh, so I, I am deeply skeptical yes. about the forward-looking nature uh, in a number of no, you know, I, I very totally non-linear events. I, I totally, or non-linear yeah, yeah, events. I mean, yeah, you, you would like the market to kind of reprice risk in a kind of granular, yeah. granular <laughs> linear way. This is not and you never, you never get that. You get that. <laughs> yes, you get uh, nothing, absolutely. and then you get that, yeah. yes. But, on, but on, you know, on, on just on a detail on, on this question of Bolsonaro and Brazilian institutions, one of the things that he's been talking about recently is um, formalizing <laughs> the autonomy of the Brazilian central bank. Because you know Brazil's central bank is kind of de facto autonomous, but the the reality is that the Brazilian president has the sole capacity to to hire and fire the Brazilian central bank governor. If Brazilian central bank autonomy were to be kind of you know legally enshrined, that's a, a decent structure reform. Cool. So let me thank David for taking for first of all for writing the book and for <laughs> offering a textbook in my class. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you and, for making it a textbook. <laughs> and thank you, Ellen, for taking the time. And thank you all for, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.